So what I would like, what I would like to talk about is um, a koan. It feels appropriate um, to talk about a koan in a Zen retreat. At the beginning of our time together this morning, I said, uh, realization is everything, and it's extra. Both of those things are true. All of us are here to some degree for the reason of realizing ourselves, to realize something uh, that's large and deep and true about our lives, about our existence. Um, that it might be a response to suffering, it might be um, a circumstance you're struggling with and trying to live through, it might be a question that's plaguing you uh, that you're imagining there might be an answer to. But ultimately, the only reason we choose to do activity like we are doing today is because on some level we have faith in our ability to wake up. If you didn't believe you could do that, you wouldn't be here which means you must have some degree of faith in your realized nature, your capacity to realize, your awakened nature, your capacity to awaken, right? You've seen that already happen in your life many, many, many times. You didn't see it, and then you did. You didn't get it, and then you did. Right? All of a sudden, something happened, and you had a bigger perspective. The world got bigger. Oh, you could include more. Your understanding could include more. Your heart could include more. You realized your life was much bigger than you imagined because of whatever that thing was. Right? So on some level, you have an awareness of, a trust, a faith, if you wish, in your capacity to wake up. Further, I would argue that you probably have a faith that to wake up changes your relationship with suffering. It probably changes the way you're going to show up in the world. Right? In other words, that it's essentially a good thing, an evolutionary movement, an expansion. There's something that's fundamentally loving or compassionate or wise about wanting to wake up. I would argue all of us probably have that. We might use different words to describe it, but I'm going to guess that that's why you're here today. There's a lot of things you could be doing today that would be easier. Um, there's a lot of things you could be doing today that would be more comfortable that would help put you back to sleep. You know? But it's interesting you're choosing to do what you're doing. It's interesting, right? So you already have both things. You have a realized nature. You must. I've just described it to you the best I can. You can describe it to yourself however you wish. But you also must know about the other half, which is the part of you that isn't yet awake. The parts of you that are caught, the parts of you that aren't illuminated yet, the parts of you that aren't seen, the parts of you that aren't integrated or known. Right? To enlighten just means to see. It really is like bringing a flashlight or a candle or some sort of light source into a space you can't see. Right? During the power outage, you've got to grab your flashlight and go downstairs and see if you can find the fuse box. You're carrying light with you and you're enlightening so that you don't trip on the ottoman and you don't... right? fall down the stairs and you're looking to find a fuse box so that you can see if one of the little flippers is switched or switched is flipped or whatever, right? You're enlightening it. That's all. That's all. We inflate that word, especially in places like this, to our detriment. We inflate that word into meaning something and attaching something. We also tend to assume that it's a one-time deal. I held a flashlight once no, it's a big basement. There's a lot to see, right? So you have a realized nature. Realization is everything. It's the reason for the Buddhist path. It's certainly the reason for the Zen expression of the Buddhist path. The understanding that when I see something, I can be in more loving or skillful accord with it. I can call that right relationship. I'm wise enough to know that when all the lights go out, I might want to go downstairs and look at the fuse box. Buddhism is all about the acknowledgement of human suffering 
and then immediately the investigation of it. Oh, you should understand what that thing is. Yeah, it's real. It's here all the time. Human suffering. You're born. You have it. It'll be here the whole time you're here. That's okay. That's okay. You have a capacity to change your relationship with that thing if you understand it better. Why don't you get closer to it? Hold a light in your hand and see what you can see. Right? There's an intellectual examination of that. There's an emotional examination of that. There's a bodily examination of that. All sorts of layers Buddhism plays with. But all of it's about the investigation of our unrealized nature, the parts of us that are in the dark that we just don't see. You feel here that dark isn't a judgment. It's just I just don't see it. It's in the dark, right? The backyard that we walked in isn't different at night. It's just dark. (laughs) It isn't like, oh, it's a good place during the day, and it's a bad place. No, 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 no. Same flowers, same grass, same rocks. It's It's just out there. And I just have a harder time seeing it at night. And so that's really the core of the whole tradition, is realizing, oh, the things that I don't see when I'm not in right relationship with those things causes me a tremendous amount of suffering, and therefore it causes my friends and my family and my acquaintances and the people in my voting district. <laughs> suffering too, right? Because suffering breeds suffering. So I make a vow. I have an aspiration to begin to understand more about my unrealized nature, the parts of me that get caught. And we have all sorts of words for this. Greed and hate and delusion, we call them the poisons, right? Or we call it the red dusts. This is our humanity. This is samsara or our samsaric nature or our compounded nature or our um, conditioned mind. Ooh, or if we're feeling really judgmental, small self. Or if we're feeling really, really judgmental, false self. Uh, The backyard is false at night. It's a false backyard. It's ridiculous. But that's what we call it, your false self. You must wake up to your true self. That's nice. They're at war already. Isn't that nice? Just because of the nature of our language. They're already fighting with each other. I'm the good one. Isn't that fun? Anyway, the reason I said realization is extra is because I just want you to know why you're here. Because realization is everything. You already know that part. You already do know that that's why you're here. You want to wake up. But the reason realization is extra is important to remind ourselves of is because when we hear teachings like realization is everything, it creates a tension in us. We imagine that we're not that. And so we strive for it. And even in the word strive, you can feel the constriction, can you? How was your day today? Pretty good. Did you strive? Oh, shit. No, maybe it wasn't a good day. (laughs) Damn. Could I have tried harder? I'm only sweating sweat. I'm not sweating blood. Oh, well, you better get back out there. This is striving, right? (laughs) It's kind of of funny to laugh at. It's also sort of true that Zen has a reputation for sit as if your head is on fire, and I kind of get it. I kind of get it. The problem of human suffering is compelling. So again, the reason I'm saying it's also extra is because it's really important that the spirit with which we look, the spirit with which we hold that flashlight and investigate our experience of being alive is from a patient and still and large place. That's why I'm saying it's also extra. We talk about that actually a lot in this tradition. Dogen is the name of a very influential Japanese monk and scholar and writer. He was extremely prolific. He lived by our calendar from the year 1200 to the year 1253, which is a pretty long time for that era. And he talked a lot about unrealized Buddhas. Unrealized Buddhas who know that they are unrealized are realized. He wrote a lot in the kind of paradox, language that turned back on itself. Realized Buddhas who are aware of their unrealization are realized Buddhas. I'm paraphrasing um, the Genjo Koan, but the reason this is emphasized in our Soto tradition is because when we create a division between ourselves and realization, we've already created a false split. That's not true. It's not a real split. And further, it creates um, a tension that I've described and a grasping that I've described and a striving that I've described that does not serve us. It does not serve us well. 
we all understand um, what a gaining idea feels like. I came to the Zen Center today. I'm doing this day of practice thing. It's weird. It's like eight hours or something, I guess. They're going to have us do a bunch of really weird stuff. But here's the deal. It's a Zen retreat, right? At a Zen Center, an official Zen Center. I'm like, dun 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 official, right? And they're probably going to wear robes, and it's going to be really, really weird. But here's the deal. I'm doing it in exchange for, and then you'd fill in the blank. At the end of eight hours, I expect to get. No, that's normal. That's fine. If you see that in yourself, good for you. I'm glad you see it. Good for you. That's fine. That's not a problem. Because you see it. Good. You notice you're doing one thing in exchange for another thing. That's how ego operates. That's how human life operates. That makes sense. Right? Zen is the candy bar. You paid your dollar. You get your candy bar at the end. Right? I get it. That's cool. That's not a problem. It's not a problem because you see it. So what Zen is the very first tradition to do is say, we have a whole bunch of tools that are going to help you acknowledge the fact that you do that. That's what normal human beings do. It's called grasping mind, wanting mind, exchange mind. That's how we think as humans. It's not a problem. Just acknowledge that it's there. It's part of your karmic conditioning. So let's investigate what's in the basement of that. I wonder why you imagine that you lack something that you need to get. Let's look at that. It's okay that you think that. I bet there's truth to it, and I bet there's also not truth to it. Wouldn't it be cooler to get closer to that? You know, when we're reaching for a feeling, we're running away from another feeling. And so Zen is very, very quick to go, I get that you're reaching for something else. I get it. I get it. Let's look at what you're running from. It might actually be that you're okay being with that. It might actually be that you can expand to hold it without affliction. It might actually be that you can make a home in that place that you already are and create an okayness around it that doesn't demand that you leave part of your life behind in order to find something. Does that kind of make sense? Does that kind of make sense? It's okay if it doesn't. Oh, I was going to talk about a cone, wasn't I? I haven't gotten to the title yet. <laughs> I first came in this building in 1993. I stayed for, I don't know, a year, probably a year and a half. It didn't make sense to me. The place felt really different then. I was in a very different place in my life. I took a class I didn't understand even two syllables of. It didn't make any damn sense at all. And I was like, wow, there's something going on in that building, and there's a coolness there, but it ain't for me. This is not the right whatever, so I ran screaming. Um, and um, <laughs> I danced with Sin for a long time, here and at other sanghas, and on my own, and all blah. And I finally came back in 2005, whatever it was, 2005, 2006, I want to say 2005. And I happened to come, just by accident, I happened to come on a Sunday and it was the middle of Rohatsu. It was in December. So it was like day six of an eight-day retreat. Right? So the whole building was just like, boom. You could feel it when you walked in. Like, there have been 20 people who have been sitting in this place for seven days and haven't spoken. This place is thick. It was just like, bam, it was juicy, right? It was like 50 people showed up to show up for the talk and then skedaddle, right? <clears throat> and Tim was the new guy, the new guy. Full head of hair, so very suspicious. I mean, come on. Right, this is, who does this guy think he is? I don't know why I'm telling this story, just because I'm moved today. And he was talking about the Shin Shin Ming, which is a famous, very early Zen poem, arguably still Taoism, but whatever, we're not going down that road. And he gave a 40-minute talk, and it just blew the top off my head. I didn't understand a word of it. But it did the thing. It did the thing. I was just like, something's going on. I'm in love with this. This is so cool. And he was like five minutes toward the end and he went, so that's the title of the poem. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, you've been here for seven days and you just wrapped up your final talk on the title of the poem. The poem was like three pages long. I'm like, how long are you guys going to be here? It is going to take you forever to get through this poem. And for whatever reason... That made me so happy that there was so much in just like the six Chinese characters in the title that he had talked about it for five, six, seven days. Oh, I fell in love. 
Okay. Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when deeply practicing prajna paramita, clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty and thus relieved all suffering. We all chanted that together about 20 minutes ago. It's the first sentence of the Heart Sutra. It is fair to say the entire sutra is in that sentence. The rest of it is just an exposition of that sentence. It's just one way of understanding it. There's so much in that sentence you could easily just spend the rest of your life on that. That's lovely. What I'm interested in today are the last three words. Relieved all suffering. Ooh, mama. You're a fascinating little scripture, Heart Sutra. Did you just make me a promise? I'm really interested in the word relieved. This is just a translation, of course, right? Probably this was written in Chinese, probably reverse translated into Sanskrit, they're guessing now. Perhaps it was written in Sanskrit and translated into Chinese. We're actually a little bit not sure. But some of these Prajna Paramita Sutras, they're now being like, yeah, I think they're probably Chinese, at least from the diamond forward. And then reverse translated. I'm saying reverse translated because early uh, scriptures were written in either Pali or Sanskrit in, in India, right? And then they were translated into Tibetan or Chinese whatever, as, as uh, Buddhism spread. So, in English, we have the three words, relieved all suffering. So if I asked every single human being who's ever walked in the door of this place for the 50 years that's been here, how come you're here? I'm here to relieve suffering, would be a pretty popular answer, right? That's a pretty popular answer, and it ties in brilliantly with your awareness that you have realization, and your awareness that there are also things about you that are unrealized. Which means you must know, oh, the unrealization must have a relationship to suffering. I bet if I understood more deeply, I bet if I experienced a little differently, I bet if I expanded and held more, I bet I would change my relationship with suffering. Yes, it would. Yeah. Relieved all suffering. So here's how we're going to get to that today. Um, this is from the 300 Koan Shobogenzo of Master Dogen. This is case number 225. I'm just giving you those details because there's a handful of you in this room who've got Zen bad. You're afflicted with Zen. You're not taking your inoculations. You've got it bad. It's probably terminal. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to look up later Master Dogen's 300 Koan Shobogenzo, I strongly recommend you do. Case 225 is Dongshan's Heat and Cold. It's also in, uh, I think, the Blue Cliff record, although I don't know what the number is. So here's our koan today. A monk asked Master Dongshan, Heat and cold descend upon us. How can we avoid them? Dongshan answered, Why don't you go to the place where there is no cold or heat? The monk continued, well, where is the place where there is no cold or heat? And Dungshan said, when it is cold, let it be so cold that it kills you. When it is hot, let it be so hot that it kills you. End of poem. Does some of you know that one? Is that familiar to some of you? Yeah. There's a, a few different versions, a few different, it's in a couple of different collections. There's a f- couple of different commentaries, there's a couple of different capping verses, there's all sorts of stuff we're not going to get into today. I'm going to read it for you one more time. It's a very, very complete teaching, and so everything I say after is going to ruin it. That's why I want to repeat it again. Just let it roll around in your heart, right? You already know this. I promise Dongshan doesn't know anything more than you do. You already know this. He's just expressing it in a strange way. A monk asked Master Dungshan, cold and heat descend upon us. How can we avoid them? Dungshan answered, why don't you go to the place where there is no cold or heat? The monk continued, well, well, where is the place where there is no cold or heat? And Dungshan said, when it's cold, let it be so cold that it kills you. When it's hot, let it be so hot that it kills you. Oh. Oh, it's so good. It's so beautiful. Mm. Man, that is just... 
That is so beautiful to me. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about it because it's my job and I'm going to ruin it. Um, but please hold it as yours because this, this koan was written for you. Don't imagine it was written for anybody else. I mean that in a really literal way. I know this was supposedly history and that it happened supposedly 1,200 years ago in a country that's on the other side of the world and a culture we'll never understand, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's great. That's fine. But if it's not for you, who the hell else is it for? If it's not about you, it's dead. You're the only one with the flashlight. So if you want to know anything about this, and you get to choose whether or not you want to know anything about it, it's about you. The koan's obviously about you. All koans are about you. You are the monk, and you are a dungshan, and you are heat, and you are cold. It's just like looking at a dream. You're all the characters in the dream. Koans are the very same way. They're like little tiny myths, so they're like little tiny dreams where all the characters are you. So let your investigation be personal. It's about you. What's skillful to say about this? What I love about it is, and this is just me now, right? So this is me interpreting my dream, and you get to interpret your own. But I love this one because the monk shows his hand immediately, and you're like, oh, this is going to be so great. You immediately drop the ball, the very first thing, and this is so wonderful. So all we're going to help you to do, sweetheart, is pick it up. I'm saying sweetheart because we all drop the ball all the time, and to recognize you've dropped the ball immediately is, oh, I know that feeling. Look, you've dropped it all. Sweetheart. (laughs) Right? A little affection for the knucklehead who's trying to avoid that's the dropped ball. Master Dungshan, cold and heat descend upon us. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. All the time, dude. <laughs> right? My back itches. My kid won't stop crying. It's too hot. It's too cold. What if, what if they get elected? What if they don't get elected? I'm scared. I don't like it. I want more of this. I want less of that. My boss doesn't understand me. My car needs a new alternator. Come on, man. This is just life. Cold and heat descending upon us. Well, the thing you don't like. Yeah, I know. I know. All the time. How do we avoid it? <laughs> And it's like, wow, that is awesome. You just asked a Zen teacher, how to avoid my life? Like, what, you really came to the wrong place. (laughs) You, like, really came to the wrong guy at the wrong place. Which means you came to the right guy at the right place. Because he'll just turn you right back around again. Oh, sweetheart, you see you're trying to run away. I wonder if that's why it hurts so much. Maybe cold is just cold. And maybe heat is just heat. In fact, what if you relinquished all of your defenses against your experience so thoroughly you let them kill you? Right? Isn't that dramatic? It's very dramatic. No one's actually dying here. Relax. No one's actually dying. This isn't a literal death. It's death to resistance. Death to the party that fights it. Stupid heat. Stupid baby. Stupid alternator. Stupid manager. Stupid death. Right? When the person you love gets that stage 4 cancer diagnosis. Cancer keeps descending upon me. How do I avoid it? Oh, you can't. You can't. Let it kill you. Die with your friend. Die together. All the way. All the way, die. Just go right into it. Wow. Can you feel the beauty of that? Just all the way into it. Wow. All the way into it. No resistance. You find your life there. Oh, there's fullness there. It's just amazing. Yes, that basement is so dark. Dark basements keep descending upon me. Power outages keep descending upon me. How do I avoid them? Oh, I'll just buy a backup generator. See, and then you know, it could be propane powered in that way. <laughs> this is worldly wisdom would be buy a backup generator. Zen wisdom is let the darkness kill you. Let the darkness kill you. Go down into it and let it kill you thoroughly. That's where you find yourself. It is understood in this tradition that our resistance to what is is what causes us suffering. We suffer when we say no. It's one way, if you wanted, you could translate the second noble truth. Human existence is marbled with suffering. Human existence is defined by suffering. Human existence is rife with suffering. Suffering is part of human existence. That's noble truth number one. If you're born, it's too late. Which makes sense. That's number one. 
And number two is, why? Like, what causes that? And one way of understanding number two is, because you're saying no. You're saying no. Cold and heat are painful. It hurts to be too cold and it hurts to be too hot. I understand that. But if we really, really want to amp that up, we can fight against it. And now we have pain plus suffering. Now we've got two things going on. The part of me that's like, oh, I noticed that I'm not comfortable. It's a little hot. It's hot. It's too hot. Is it cold for you guys? It's cold. It's too cold. We all know that. It's a feeling in your body. Your body's cold. But now I also have the, damn it! I mean, I even love the translation, descend upon us. Like, wow, my life is being acted on by forces. (laughs) Oh, this poor monk, God, I swear I live 95% of my life being this guy. It's happening to me. Oh, why is it happening to me? It's cosmic in its implications, right? Like, you are being punished. We're going to give that guy more cold down there. Look at him. He's getting cocky down there. Give him more cold. Look at him. He's having a good day. He pisses me off. More cold for him. I was raised Catholic, so. Oh, come on. Come on. There. There. There's the penance. That's the piety I wanted. Grr, you little. Oh, this is how we think, though, right? We put ourselves right at the center, and then we think things happen to us. Cold happens to us. Cold doesn't happen to us. It's so funny to think that. Like, I'm experiencing cold, and I'm fighting it. Okay, cool. Now you have discomfort, plus you have suffering. One of those things you get to do something about. One you cannot. (laughs) Oh, so that's why Dung Chan just prodding this poor guy. Oh, it's so sweet. All right. I'll say two more things and then I'll shut up. Let the cold kill you. Such a great line. Um, I'm going to jump to another... Another scripture, this is from the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, Some of you may know that as the Flower Garland or the Garland of Flowers Sutra. In each and every one of the hells, Buddhas pass innumerable eons. In order to liberate sentient beings, they are able to bear these pains. The one body is infinite, and the infinite two are one. Understanding all the worlds, Buddha manifests forms everywhere. The atoms of all lands everywhere are each and every one a Buddha. To be able to know their number, this is what work should be done. Oh, mama. That's another big one. It's one of my favorite passages. It's relevant in my head because they are able to bear these pains. Cleary is the translator there, Thomas Cleary. It's not lost on me. He chose the word pain. You live in Minnesota. You have borne the pain of it being too hot and too humid many, many times. You have borne the pain of it being way too cold many, many times. Eh. I mean, honestly, eh. Yeah, it's too cold, it's too hot. Okay. You can do that. You literally can do that. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, I'm hungry. Yeah, hunger is present. My back hurts. Yeah, pain is present. I'm not invalidating your experience. I'm not diminishing your experience. I'm just reminding you you're way bigger than, oh, I'm hot. So what? You're hot. Good. Hold hot. Be with hot. Feel it. Feel it all the way to the bottom and realize you're way bigger than hot. It's just hot. It's just hot. That's all it is. Put pain in its proper place. You are so big, you can easily say yes to all of it. It's not that big of a deal. Seriously. This is me giving you a a reminder of the power of what you actually are. You can be with pain. It suddenly becomes quite manageable when you turn toward it and say, yes, I see that you are here. Hi, restlessness. Hi, restlessness. It's okay. You are a huge mansion. You can hold the one little guest within your walls called restless or sad or heartbroken. Again, I'm in no way diminishing the intensity the discomfort, the validity of that experience. 
All I'm saying is when you constrict around it with your no, it becomes overwhelming. One of the words I hear more often than any other word in that room upstairs when I meet with people, I meet with a lot of people. Overwhelmed. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I understand that I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling overwhelmed because of, and then they list the things. The things that are happening. Their stupid manager and their dumb alternator and the weather's too hot and their kid won't stop crying and they list the reasons. And I understand that. I'm like, yes, I'm right there with you. I get overwhelmed. But as soon as I hear the word overwhelmed, I'm like, oh, obviously you've constricted. Because you're describing feeling small in the face of something that is larger than you. You can't hold it all. That's what you're describing to me. You're describing to me fear. That's what you're describing. I know that feeling. That's okay. That's, I, I totally get that. But can you, imagine, can you, can you see what I, where I go? What you're imagining is, I'm the container and I'm quite small. And the thing that's descending upon me is too big for me to hold. And that's my interpretation of what's happening. And I validate that story. I understand that that's a story. But your realized nature, the reason you are here today as meditators, you're a meditator for at least another few hours, is the ability to watch that. You can see that. You can bear witness to that. You just got through describing the container, and you described your things that are happening to you, and you described your feelings. You are not any of them, obviously, or you couldn't describe them to me. You must be the witness to them. You must be the one who observes them. You're in relationship to them already just by naming them for me. There's some part of you that's remembering how big you actually are. I got so lonely. Oh, you can see a thing called lonely. You are therefore not lonely. It's happening as an experience, but you're not defined by it. Because you can see it. Because you can relate to it. Because you can give me a word that describes it. Cool. Good for you. Let's, let's investigate lonely. That's fine. But can you feel how right now I'm not overwhelmed anymore? The container just got larger. I'm saying yes to it. Hi, lonely. Welcome. Come on in. I get that you're here. Poof, it's a lot today. <laughs> That's okay. I'm big. What's going on under there? Why don't you tell me about it? Can you feel how much bigger you are right now? You're just in relationship to it. All right? We're not overwhelmed by other people's pain. We're curious about other people's pain when we love them. Right? Tell me more about it. Oh, how did they make you feel? Oh, then what did he say? Right? You know the way you do. You lean toward. You want to know more. You're not scared of being overwhelmed by their experience. It's the same thing on the cushion. A human being is going to show up and meet you there today. You. And you get just to be super, super invested, curious. Wonder about them. What are they asking? What are they experiencing? It's fine that they're here. It's totally fine that they're here. What a thing that is. To be curious about our own suffering. To go down into it all the way. It's okay that you're here. Isn't that cool? It's suddenly manageable. It's suddenly not overwhelmed. Because you relax. You got a little larger. The atoms of your body remember that they're Buddha. So, so, to let heat and cold kill us is to go to the place where there is no heat and no cold. The elixir is hidden in the poison, so come to the poison. Rumi said that. Not a Zen teacher. Technically. <laughs> Untechnically, a great Zen teacher who really got it. The elixir is hidden in the poison, so come to the poison. That is the most Mahayana Zen sentence ever uttered in the history of Mahayana Zen, which is why Buddhist delegations attended the funeral of Rumi in 12... I forget what it was. He postdates Dogen by about a decade or something like that. Um, they attended his funeral because, like, yeah, he's one of ours. It's like, no, no, he's a Muslim. He lives in Turkey. Oh, no, no, he's one of ours. Have you read his stuff? He's one of ours. Interestingly, so did the Muslims attend his funeral. Interestingly, so did the Jews. Interestingly, so did the Christians. Interesting, so did the, everybody. Everybody came to so like, this is our guy. So you are that. Your truth isn't Buddhist. Buddhism is a container that it holds just like the water. 
is being held in this cup right now. It's in no way defined by this cup. Thank you, cup. You're a helpful little container for me today. Hey, Zen. Hey, Buddhism. Glad you're here. You're useful. But eh, I'm not nourished by the cup. I'm nourished by the water in it. The elixir is hidden in the poison. The reason I say that's a Mahayana Buddha statement is because we're like, your enlightenment comes from the suffering. Please go into it. Recognize the parts of you that are caught. Go toward the roots. No mud, no lotus. We always want just this and not this. We want the flashlight, not the baseline. We want the lotus and not the mud. We want the good and not the bad. We want the freedom and not the constriction. We don't want to be descended upon by heat or cold. I want to go to the place where there's no heat or no cold. Can you feel the part of you that wants that? That's the part of you that's in pain. I understand that. That's your humanity. I understand that too. You realize nature doesn't want any of those things because it doesn't want anything. Why would it? You understand that, right? The free part of you doesn't have any conditions. It doesn't like want human life to be different. Why would it? It never would. The most loving part of you doesn't need anything to be different. How could it? Love doesn't need things to be different. It just loves. Your enlightenment just shines. It's like the light you bring in the basement. It doesn't care what it's shining on. Don't show me the rats. Don't show me the cockroaches. Just show me the boxes of Christmas decorations that are stacked correctly. Thank you very much. <laughs> it just shines. It can, you can't fail at this. That's why I say it's okay. The wave that never realizes it's the ocean is just exactly as much of the ocean as the wave that knows it's the ocean. It's not winning. You're not winning. You don't need to. Isn't that a relief? Isn't that a relief? The atoms of our body are Buddha already. We've already gone to the place where there's no heat and cold. So all we're doing today is we're letting the heat and cold kill us. If you have friends in your life who are very curious about what you're doing today, that would be a really dramatic way of explaining to them what you did today. It wouldn't make any sense. They might think you're deep. I'm just saying, <laughs> I recommend it. What'd you do? I went to the Zen Center and I let the heat kill me. It wasn't that hot today. Oh, you don't understand, man. <laughs> this is a different kind of heat. <laughs> oh... I thank you for your attention. Um, and as I said at the beginning, don't worry about anything I said. Don't worry about remembering it. Don't worry about getting it. Zen has a long tradition, um, a beautiful tradition of literary expression um, through, through scriptures and through koan, especially that's part of our literary uh, contribution to the library of the history of Buddhism is the koan system in Zen. But um, you don't have to be clever. It's not an anti-intellectual tradition. We use the mind, the brain, um, thinking, quite, thinking consciousness quite a lot. But you do not have to be clever to do this. Clever gets in the way, actually, more often than it doesn't. My religion is kindness. Those are my four favorite words from the Dalai Lama. What's the essence of your religion? My religion is kindness. Can you feel how that's the water in the glass? And in the glass, like, oh, it's Tibetan Buddhist glass. I hold it in, or Tibetan Buddhist cup, or a Japanese Soto Zen cup, or a Christian cup, or a secular humanist cup, or a... Who cares? Kindness is something we all understand. And we tend to, um, we tend to, number one, not foster it. And number two, we don't turn it toward ourselves very often. So when Dong Shan said, please let the cold kill you, that's what he was saying. Please say yes to your pain. I mean, just meet it with as much kindness as you possibly can. That's the only thing that ever changes anything in the world. Clever ideas don't change things, but kindness does. So that's what we're here to do, and I'm grateful that you're here doing that. I'm inspired by people who make the decision to try to meet their life with kindness, because it changes the world. That's my faith. And so thank you. Thank you for doing that. That's enough. A lot of me. Thank you.